Good evening and welcome to the Ardrain Automobile Museum here in Newport, Rhode Island. We're excited to welcome you to our new exhibition, Women Take the Wheel, Fashion, Modernity and the Automobile, 1900 to 1945. I'm Donald Osborne, the CEO here, and this is an exciting presentation that we're about to embark upon. It is our first collaboration with another great Newport institution, the Newport Historical Society. This exhibition shows the way that the automobile influenced fashion and the way it developed, as well as the role of women in society and how ultimately fashion impacted the automobile. To help tell that story, I will be joined by David Amuzio, our executive director here at the Audrain, and by Rebecca Kelly, guest curator of the Newport Historical Society. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Donald. Good evening. This exhibition will feature cars from the Audrain collection, as well as some cars borrowed from great friends and other collections around New England, and highlights an amazing assortment of clothes, which were the, the result of a wonderful long-term loan by a generous donor to the uh, Newport Historical Society. Uh, Rebecca, just tell us a little bit about these clothes, where they came from, and what they celebrate. Um, so this is a really wonderful collection of clothing um, that ranges in date from 1880. We're showcasing clothing from 1880 to 1945 through um, both venues of the exhibition. And it's just an incredible look at, you know, the transition of women's fashion from the late Gilded Age, you know, crossing through the 1920s into the real modernity. And you're just going to see a really wonderful range of um, interesting silhouettes and different fabrics. Thanks. And, of course, David, we love to tell a story of automobiles and how they impact society because in our role of celebrating, preserving, and sharing automotive history, it's something that we do very well here at the Audrain and I think that the addition of these costumes, these, 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 these bits of clothing, tells us a little bit more about the life of the people that use these cars. Absolutely. It also gives scale to the automobile. Which is a very important thing because one of the things that is so exciting about this exhibition as well is the fact that one of the things that, that is so great about Newport for me is the fact that Newport is living history. Uh, here in this exhibition between the two institutions, we'll also have a walking tour so that uh, we are encouraging our visitor guests to visit both the Audrain and the Newport Historical Society and to walk down Bellevue Avenue and Touro Street to see the environment in which many of these clothes actually first existed and certainly the, uh, the roads in which these cars drove on. Uh, the exhibition starts here at the Audrain with this absolutely beautiful uh, 1902 Packard Model F, and immediately uh, I am drawn to the, uh, the reality that most of the clothes that were worn by women in the 1880s would be absolutely impossible to wear when riding in the car like this. Absolutely, quite dangerous actually, <laughs> when you think about having to step up into it and uh, all of the bustles and petticoats, etc. Just the shape of those seats. You can just absolutely imagine, you know, it's, it's a thing that the, the automobile certainly helped to liberate in a very real sense uh, women from some of the constrictions of uh, the, the time. And I think we can also see here the fact that automobiling was an adventure. So what you might wear for a formal luncheon is not what you would wear to go out for a ride in your automobile. Right, that's right, Donald, exactly. And I think that, um, you know, the you know desire to participate in these great adventures absolutely changed clothing so you know women needed this protective gear some of the things that we might be seeing behind us here in just a few minutes these overcoats and dusters um, to protect the delicate fabrics and all the stuffs of fashion and also david i know that in our last exhibition uh, balance and power the world on two wheels 1885 to 1945 uh, 1995 rather we certainly saw the transition from the velocipede and the early uh, bicycle to the motorcycle and its development. And one of the things which is quite interesting is the way the, the items demanded certain uh, way of approaching them. You know, if you were going to ride a bicycle, you were going to ride a motorcycle, you had to be protected from the elements. And when you realize what people were coming from, from the horse-drawn carriage, mm. a car like this was like riding a space shuttle on the street. <laughs> yeah, certainly wind in your face. Yeah, much, much quicker than a bicycle or a horse-drawn carriage. The capability and performance of, of these early cars, I think, cannot be overestimated in their societal uh, position at the time. And one of the other things, of course, which is quite interesting about this exhibition, and 
we will, as we have on all of our exhibitions here at the Audrain, be coming to you uh, with detailed videos as the exhibition is in progress, telling you more about the cars and more about the fashion. Rebecca will come back and we'll do that. So tonight we're just getting an overview so that you get an idea of what you will see when you come here to the gallery uh, at 222 Bellevue. And one, of course, of the most important parts of this exhibition is the sociological role of the automobile and women. Um, and this is really shown quite well in the next car we're going to talk about, which is this wonderful Packard Roadster. Let's take a look. Tell us a little bit about this car, David. Great car. Um, we borrowed it from Evan Eide, a good, good friend and collector in Oxbridge, Massachusetts. Um, Model 30, but not like the big Model 30 you think of. This is the sport version. Short wheelbase, um, engine pushed back a little, a little better balance. Um, really, really meant as a, as a, as a real sporting, sporting car. It had nothing to do with, with uh, transportation in general. This was a fun car to drive and very capable. This is a car that really set the tone for roadsters in the future, like the Mercer Raceabout and Runabout. And the characteristics of those cars were very much what we would call, or they would call at the time, a man's car. I mean, even naming it a gentleman's roadster. But things were changing, and very quickly, and here in Newport. That's really exciting. Let's take a look at this other car, which is really amazing. From the Packard Gentleman's Roadster to this amazing Mercedes Simplex. This remarkable car comes to us courtesy of the Owl's Head Museum of Transportation in Maine. This is very interesting. This car, probably certainly for me one of the stars of the exhibition, is very likely the car that Gladys Vanderbilt drove in 1905 at the time of her debut. And thinking about the fact that her cousin Willie Kay was a great automobilist and his 1907 Renault AI is in the show, but that's sort of to be expected. But Gladys almost sort of made more than a sensation driving this car at that time. Tell us a little bit about that, uh, Rebecca. Yeah, well, I think the research team, we were really excited as we started thinking about connections between the Vanderbilt family that go beyond Willie Kay and driving and thinking about the women of the family. Um, so we were really excited to come across this quote when we were doing some archival research in the newspapers. And we just thought it was really, really sensational to you know, learn that Gladys was at the wheel and that her mom, Alice Vanderbilt, was in the back and that they were spotted on Bellevue Avenue right in front of this very building. So really fantastic story. And David, this car is an astonishing one. Not the putt-putt that you'd expect a lady to drive. Oh no, this, this was a supercar of its day. 30 horsepower, very remarkable, and also uh, quite rare. And there were only a handful of these in the country at that time. So, ex sensational car. And to see a young woman driving it with confidence, it must have been just spectacular. Absolutely amazing, I'm sure that she charmed and amazed and horrified her neighbors and, and the social set in equal measure. Uh, we also spoke about how the clothes of the time were demanded by the conditions of automobiling. And so you see the great duster coats and the goggles. And on the other hand, also, Rebecca, you and I have chatted about the fact that these clothes on the one hand seem eminently practical for the rigors of automobiling, but the colors are very light, the fabric is very delicate. How does that work in today's eyes. Yeah, I think maybe they, um, you know, do read to us as not quite the thing that we think about as sportswear or, you know, anything that really allows for, um, you know, maybe having to change a flat tire <laughs> on the side of the road. Because, um, you know, we do see that the dusters are really protecting these really diaphanous, lightweight dresses, which in the period were called lingerie dresses, but they were the ultimate in summer fashion. You know, when you look at photographs of the casino, people watching tennis. It's these beautiful, lightweight um, summer dresses. So, um, you know, that's what would be kind of hidden underneath these dusters. Another very interesting thing about that is uh, that our great friend, uh, Miles Collier, the brilliant uh, automobile collector and historian, uh, has, has written in his new book, uh, The Archaeological Automobile, about the fact that the automobile this time was looked on as a savior uh, ecologically, because horses were so dirty and, and, and cities were so nasty. So I think that also in a way perhaps the clothes that they were wearing in the automobiles were actually 
less restrictive and, and less covering than those they might have used for a carriage ride because it was so much cleaner riding in a car than riding behind a horse. Sure, sure. And I think a lot of it was the marketing and the fashion branding and all of that thing that goes into it. You know, these coats are very much descended from carriage coats of old and, and things like that and, you know, adapted a bit. But And we're talking about what it takes to keep a car on the road. And that's also a very important part of this story because all this just didn't come out of thin air. So let's take a look at the working side of automobiling and fashion. Excellent. For anyone who spent time, as I did, watching Downton Abbey, a lot of people wondered, gee, how come every time you see Branson <laughs> before he graduated to uh, become Rose's husband, he was always working at something in, in, the, in the garage, tinkering with things. And weren't chauffeurs the people that just simply got in the car and drove the family here and drove them there? The answer, of course, is no. There was a lot of work to do to maintain a car of this period. And David, that's why we're looking at the uh, under the hood of this uh, wonderful simplex. It's an incredible car. Um, it's the very best of the best in its day. Bought new in 1915 at the New York Auto Show by the Agassiz family who owned Castle Hill on Ocean Avenue here in Newport. Um, it would have been driven, chauffeur driven from New York up to, up to Newport in the summer. Uh, but just a, a remarkable piece of machinery. Um, you know, this is a, a very expensive car, um, very comfortable. Um, and in, in completely enclosed with roll-up windows. So a very different kind of car uh, than we would just saw. And one of the things about a car like this is the fact that as opposed to today where we're used to uh, almost maintenance-free cars, we buy a car, we put gas in it, and that's about it. The adjustments required mm. to maintain a car like this after every drive were considerable, and also as a consequence, the clothes that the uh, chauffeurs uh, used, of which we have some examples here in the show, were also much more of a workmanlike and durable nature. Exactly, Donald. Uh, you know, behind us here, we can see this really wonderful chauffeur's uniform from about 1925. So, you know, the remarkable thing about this Vanderbilt Provenance collection is it's, you know, not just the family clothes, but um, associated things as well. So this is a really special extant example of a beautifully tailored uniform with a great coat, um, beautifully made by James Patterson and Company of New York, where the Vanderbilts often bought um, livery. Um, so it's a really great opportunity to exhibit this piece for the first time. We'll also see a great connection because they're a wonderful deep red color, which we will also see in an automobile later in the exhibition because it's a Vanderbilt color. Right, maroon. Exactly. Preferred color. And one of the other things that's quite interesting is that the, the pants are jodhpurs, which are designed to be worn with boots. Again, an indication of what the conditions were like because it's very likely a chauffeur did not work in shoes because they had to get out and change tires and all this. So boots were definitely the, uh, the footwear of the moment. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why we decided to kind of show it as three individual pieces so that you could really see the, the tailoring and the construction. It's quite remarkable. Yeah. Donald, the interesting thing about a chauffeur's job is, is certainly obviously he drove the family when they were, when they were in town. but. Uh, maintenance on these vehicles was a daily routine. It's not like today where you do an oil change every 5,000 miles. Um, th they required lubrication daily as they were driven. It's uh, something which, again, we will see how the development of the automobile also helped to put more women behind the wheel. And we're gonna get an example of that right now around the corner here. Great. As the automobile developed, there was, there was not the, the definite emphasis on the internal combustion gasoline engine, uh, but rather steam and electric cars had an equal, in some cases, more prominent place in the automotive landscape than the gasoline internal combustion. And it was the electric car that really did more than anything else to help put women behind the wheel. And this example that we have behind us, this 1911 Roush and Lang Roadster, is a really remarkable car. And David, tell us a little bit about electric cars, especially here in Newport and their own society. Yeah, this is incredibly exciting. A recent addition to our collections. Uh, Roush and Lang was at the very top of quality production um, in, its, in the day. Um, and it was really a time when the idea that you, you had a car that was easy to start, you didn't have to crank it, 
It was odorless and silent um, and very easy to drive, uh, no transmission, uh, just forward or reverse. So very easy to drive. Um, women took to it quite, quite easily. And it was really, a, I, think, I think of it as a sense of freedom. Um, they were still promenading in horse-drawn carriages, but this allowed them to get behind the wheel, in this case a tiller, uh, and, and, and promenade up and down Bellevue Avenue, go on short trips, take it to evening events, et cetera. And Rebecca, because of that freedom from explosions and oil and all of this, <laughs> all of a sudden, again, the fashion opportunities opened up like the example we've got here. Exactly, you could retire your duster and put away your goggles and your diaphanous veil that you know were protecting your face from the wind and all of these uh, things in the past and you could really drive a car like this in your cloak that you might be wearing out in the evening or a wonderful little you know day suit and a hat so um, really fantastic. Our next trip is going to be further along the the uh, the Gladys realm as we look at some of the most exciting cars of the 1920s and how fashion influenced those cars and how the automobile world began to look at fashion and design in a totally different way. Let's look at some really fancy cars, Rolls Royces and Duesenbergs. All right. By the time we get to 1923 and when this Rolls Royce uh, Ghost Piccadilly Roadster was built, the idea of women driving fast, interesting cars was basically set. And this is a car I think that has amazing style, especially again for a Rolls Royce of the period. You don't think of them as being particularly sporting, but especially in a place like Newport, this would be a great society vehicle. And Rebecca, this is one of my favorite outfits that's here. And tell us a little bit about that. And it just has the same spirits as Rolls Royce. Um, absolutely, Donald. I think we've been talking a little bit before, um, you know, just about we have the really wonderful specific story of the women who wore the clothes, the Vanderbilt family, the Newport story, but also the more general fashion story that the clothing tells. Um, and in this section of the exhibition, there's some examples of just some really amazing Art Deco inspired textiles that, you know, mimic the design of the automobiles um, incredibly well. So um, I think we both love this aspect of the exhibition for sure. And the idea, the way this, 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 this coat flows, you can just see in, a, in an open car like this, a nice, fast moving open car, how, how the, the, the coat would just move and, and just enhance the, the design of it. Right, the play of the light on the velvet and the metallic lace, just really spectacular. And David, you know, cars like this, um, you know, you can see pictures that we have of period houses here in Newport with cars like this, people having come up for the weekend or, or for the month of, of their summer holiday in open cars like this, which they would not have driven typically in New York or Chicago where they live. Right. Yeah, this is, this is really the, the epitome of a, a fun sports car to, to go, to, go uh, to, your, to your vacation home in, so to speak. It's, you know, long hood, two-seater, long wheelbase, rumble seat in the back, um, open, uh, fun to drive, the highest quality. Uh, everything about it uh, is just, you know, speaks to the moment. And we're going to see next an example of a supreme style uh, and a car with a great Newport connection and uh, really sort of speaking to not only the, the Vanderbilt style, but the Newport style in general. So another pinnacle of the automobile in this period. So let's, let's take a look at the Duesenberg. Cool. We are now in what I think might be the epicenter of style in this exhibition of style. Uh, this is the 1930 Duesenberg Model J uh, Town Sedan by Murphy of Pasadena. And this is a car built for Nanoline Holt Inman Duke, Doris Duke's mother, a woman who was known for incredible style and presence. And with this, we're showing this incredible dress uh, that was created for Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney and uh, someone who certainly knew a lot about style and design. And uh, so Rebecca, tell us a little bit about this dress and then we'll talk about this car. 
Okay, great. Um, this is a fantastic piece. It was made in Paris, Donald, by a couture house called Ardance. Um, we think definitely for Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney. I think she had a friend who was working at that couture house, and she just supported artists and designers on so many different levels. You know, she was a fine artist herself, a sculptor, very famously had a studio in New York, a studio in Paris that was just like a hub for uh, creativity. So she really liked um, to do those types of things. And I think, again, this dress is just so elegant and exudes so much of what was the 1930s, just a masterful technical draping of that beautiful velvet and of course the spectacular beadwork. It's amazing and the car that uh, we paired it with David is also for me one of the most stylish cars of the period. You don't think about a town sedan being an attractive or sporty car and Murphy's done an amazing job with this car. The roof line, the, 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 the shape of it, Tell us what you think about the design of this car. Oh, it, it has such presence um, when you stand in front of it. It's very big at the same time. It has very flowing lines, um, has a removable top for the chauffeur's compartment, the driver, uh, and a, a really wonderful little cabin for the owner in the back. Um, I can imagine being driven up uh, from New York City in this in complete comfort. One of the things that's also very interesting is we were talking about how the uh, car influenced fashion and now fashion influencing designing cars. Up until this point, in about the late 1920s, cars were designed by mechanical engineers. And then all of a sudden, the stylist began to have a hand. And of course, this is a car from the heyday of the coach builders. And a customer bought a chassis and an engine from Duesenberg and then went to their own coach builder, like a couturier, and had a custom-built body to suit their preferences and their style. So this dress being custom-made uh, by a couturier in Paris and this Duesenberg being bodied by an automotive couturier in Pasadena, California, very much, they, they are very much of a piece. Absolutely, Donald. So many wonderful connections, for sure. And it's also an interesting thing that we're beginning to see, we're going to take a little detour, but in the earliest cars, they were completely open. The period photos have, have, have images of people who are riding in them very much on display with the big hats and, and very much, I am doing my automobiling here for the public. Now all of a sudden we're beginning to see, as David referenced, a compartment in the back to add a little bit of privacy. And of course as we head further into the 30s we might see a development of that a little further. But before we do, we're going to have another example of style. There's few cars of the 1930s more stylish than an Auburn Speedster. Absolutely. With this Auburn Speedster, we've probably gone about as far as we can from that Packard Model F, a car that was functional, attractive certainly, but purely function, to a car that's almost purely design. Auburn's a nice car, but this is an Auburn that is just on another planet. David, no. talk us about the legend of the Auburn oh. Speedster. It has incredible, incredible presence, and it cer certainly is all about design. When you sit in this car, it's a bit claustrophobic, small interior. When you put the top up, it's even worse. But with the top down, you're looking good driving this anywhere, uh, but also packed with technology, you know, and they, they broadcast it on the hood. Supercharged engine, guaranteed from the factory at over 100 miles an hour. They even put a plaque on the dashboard to, to you can brag about it. What, what, a, what a fantastic automobile. Nothing subtle here. And we have an amazing piece of fashion to go with it. Again, not quite subtle, is it? <laughs> Absolutely not. It's such a showstopper, right? I think um, we've all sort of identified this as one of our favorite pieces in the show. And, you know, we talked about a French couture piece there, um, but this is a made in New York. So this is very much American fashion story um, as well here at the Audrain um, by Bonwit Teller, um, famous department store and a favorite of Alice Vanderbilt's. But uh, once again, just a dynamic and incredible sparkling fabric. And it just speaks in this exhibition and in society of a time when Although things were sort of headed in a downward direction economically, there was still this moment where the people who were at the top end of society still had the confidence to display all of the, what they had and, and to enjoy it. Right, really sensational and beautiful. And we're going to see the beginning of something rather different. 
that we began to see the roots of in the, uh, the Duesenberg Model J. And a car made for a very young and very wealthy uh, woman connected very much with Newport. This next packer. Let's go see it. After the Vanderbilt, probably the name most associated with Newport is Doris Duke. And we're standing next to this 1938 Packard 12 Landelay that was commissioned by Doris when she was 26 years old. And it shows a transition in not only the way the wealthy displayed themselves in their cars and the cars they chose, but also in the way they dressed as well. Accompanying this car is a coat, uh, courtesy of the Newport Restoration Foundation, which tells a very different fashion story than what we saw with the Auburn Speedster. What do you think about that, Rebecca? Right, absolutely, Donald. Uh, this is not about surface decoration. <laughs> uh, this coat is very much about tailoring. So we just see a really lovely co coat, also made in New York by Jay Thorpe. Uh, beautiful cashmere coat um, and just like a really classic piece. I think uh, Doris was a lover of fashion as well and she had great taste and great style. Um, so not surprising to see a really lovely coat like this as part of their collection. And uh, David, is this the kind of car that you'd expect your typical 26-year-old woman to order? No, not at all. <laughs> it's remarkable. So, you know, uh, conscious of styling, she chose Ralston to body the car in New York City. Um, it, it, it is very elegant. Of course, you were saying it's a Landelay, so the rear quarter is convertible. So she can be hidden in the, in the back of the car or she can drop it and be seen. Quite remarkable design. And it, again, talks to the sociological point that we have reached, where you can still display yourself if you wish, but even when you display yourself, you're displaying yourself showing detail rather than display. And I think we see this very much in the cars, the difference between an Auburn Speedster and this Rolston Landolet, which is an incredibly elegant car where the secret are all of the details, the door handles, the, the, the shape of the, the, the side mount covers. All of those things that are very subtle and take a second glance to see. Uh, one of the things that we're going to look at next is something which is really quite amazing. Again, we talk about how Newport lives its history, and there's this incredible point of synchronicity about this exhibition that must be witnessed to believe. Let's come over into Molly O'Hara's shop. Excellent. One of the most magical <laughs> moments of this exhibition, I think, Probably one of the things that started the idea of the collaboration was the fact that there was a dressmaker who was based in New York and here in Newport who served and, and, and pleased the Vanderbilt women for, for many, many, many years. And her shop and atelier was right here in the Audrain building. Tell us a little bit about Molly O'Hara. Right. Um, so I very much think of the exhibition that way as well, Donald, that it's Molly O'Hara that brought us together to tell this really wonderful story. Um, so when I first started assessing the Vanderbilt family clothing collection, the Molly O'Hara label just kept popping up everywhere. There's about 12 to 13 pieces uh, in the collection by Molly O'Hara and you know there was not really very much known about her at all. Very much a legacy lost uh, type of story. So through Vogue magazine I started doing some research and, and right away Molly's advertisement started coming up around you know 1908, 1912 uh, and that's how I realized that she was situated here in the O'Drain building, you know, and she was very much advertising that you could find her in New York City on Fifth Avenue or during the summer season uh, in the O'Drain building. It's a, a remarkable thing because, of course, David, um, as an architect and a student of history, um, one of the things that we have been trying to do is to find out more about Adolfo Drain's tenants when he built this building, and to make this connection must have been extremely exciting. It was. It illustrated the point. We weren't really sure, but when Adolf Audrain commissioned the building, it was clear that he saw the need for uh, temporary uh, for space, temporary space for for retail and for tr trades that are c catering to the wealthy New Yorkers that are coming here in the summer. So a lot of the a lot of the occupancy of this building, whether it was the six storefronts on the ground floor, the twelve offices, or or st studios upstairs, there was a lot of changeover year to year. And I just love, again, the entire idea of living history. The fact that these clothes, which 
if they weren't made in this building, were certainly final tailored in this building and perhaps delivered from this building, have come home. It's, it's an astonishing thing and it's something that, that we really enjoy about bringing history to the place where it was created. And I think it makes it a totally different kind of history. Yeah, absolutely. It's been just, you know, a thrill to kind of bring this story to life. You know, there's still missing clues, so it's a bit of an interpretation. You know, I think we're always on the lookout for old photographs of this building and, you know, piecing it together bit by bit. It's just been, you know, detective work and really fun. So for the visitors to this exhibition, spending some time in Molly O'Hara's shop will be an absolute must point when you come to visit the gallery because it, I think, says so much about the artisans that, uh, that worked with and for the Vanderbilt family and the families of their type at the time, and also the way people lived, because these cars come alive when we, when we think about the people who drove them, people who used them and how they did it, and also these clothes. They have a spirit. They, they, they almost talk to you without getting too metaphysical about it. Um, but it is something that, that the connection, I think, is, is really fantastic. And let's take a look at the last two cars in the exhibition, and then uh, we'll come back in more detail a little later. Excellent. The next car we're going to take a look at here in the exhibition is a very interesting, very special car with a direct Vanderbilt connection. This 1938 Ford V8 sedan with a body by Brewster. It is also emblematic of something we've been talking about, the transition between being on display and being in very private circumstances. 1938, this car was built. Not only was it not a Duesenberg or a Packard, it's a Ford. It's a Ford with a custom body. So it's something that the Vanderbilts would be very comfortable with. Harold Sterling Vanderbilt was a noted yachtsman. And it's quite interesting that we see a direct Vanderbilt family connection and a little bit of a hint to his yachting uh, pursuits in this car. Uh, first, uh, let's talk about the colors of this car, uh, Rebecca. Right, once again, we're seeing the Vanderbilt love of the color maroon, uh, the family color, uh, combined with the black, and I think it's just really sleek and, and um, modern looking. And David, some of the touches that connect this car with Mike's love of sailing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's subtle. I mean, the Brewster body is subtle, although it's certainly not just a plain Ford. But when you look at the interior, there are little touches that are very yachtsman. There's some, there's some corded rope, uh, some really nice woodwork. Not what you would normally find in a Ford. Uh, so he was very involved at the New York Yacht Club, um, spent a lot of time driving us around town to the Yacht Club and to the dock. So uh, it really suited, suited his, his style. And the other thing that's quite interesting about this car, again, the idea that it's a custom-made Ford. Um, to give it a special look, the running board's deleted, and so it gives it a sportier look. Um, this wonderful uh, leather cloth grain top with these very big uh, blind C pillars uh, to make a very private cocooned atmosphere in the back. Um, this is about as subtle as you could possibly be for the wealthiest man in town. Yeah. It does have a, a dividing window in the interior, but it really is the kind of car I imagine that uh, Mike could have been in the back or driving in the front. Exactly, and this car came to us uh, at the Audrain Museum through the gracious gift of Minnie Coleman, uh, who uh, she and her husband were neighbors of uh, Mike and his wife, and uh, after his wife's passing in 1997, they purchased the car and they graciously donated it here to the uh, a drain, again, another way that we can help promote and support Newport history. Really wonderful. It's a wonderful thing. And we'll finally end our preview with incomparable piece of Newport history. The final car we're going to speak about in the exhibition tonight is this 1941 Cadillac Fleetwood limousine that was delivered new to Gladys Vanderbilt, who at that point was... Countess of Cheney. The Countess of Cheney. And this is a car that has been extensively documented in the photographic uh, record with members of the Vanderbilt family at wonderful historic occasions, including the wedding of her daughter. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 1948. And this is a car also that speaks to a very important part of the mission of both the Historical Society and the Audrain Automobile Museum, which is one of preservation. Um, Rebecca, you and I have spoken about the fact that I find it intolerable, the fact that 
we have all these incredible dresses of these wonderful women, and there are so few men's clothes that survive. Men generally wore their clothes, handed them down to somebody else who would wear them and wear them until they were unwearable and they were tossed away. But women at this point in society especially would commission these dresses and, and garments to be made, would wear them three or four times and have them packed carefully away for the next time they might wear them or never again. The spectacular tailored suit uh, that's with this Cadillac. Tell us about this garment. Right, this is a really spectacular um, suit, Donald. I mean, you're right, a lot of times men's wear doesn't survive as much in collections as women's wear does, but we're really lucky um, to have an opportunity to share this piece with you, um, the Countess Cheney's really wonderful suit um, made by Hattie Carnegie in New York. And um, when we discovered this piece, I wasn't surprised that the Countess was a Carnegie client. Um, Hattie Carnegie was known for, you know, following some really of the classic trends. This is a beautifully tailored suit, very much following what was fashionable in um, in France in the 1940s, you know, really inspired by Christian Dior and the, the new look. This suit just has a really fantastic silhouette. And it's absolutely not only perfect, but at home with this 1941 Cadillac. First of all, it's an incredibly beautiful car, very elegant, again, very simple. It's a time when the design of the top quality uh, high class cars was as subtle as it would be for decades to come until the excess of the 1950s uh, sort of wiped all that out. The detail on this Cadillac is absolutely amazing and speak a little bit about the condition of this particular car and why we keep it exactly as you see it today. Yeah, it is remarkable. So the car was driven by the family and we have a note we found in the glove box that the oil was changed in 1952. It was driven another two miles and put up on blocks in the breaker stable on Coggeshaw Avenue. And that's where it sat <clears throat> until we acquired it from the family in 2016. Uh, so it's, it's never been restored. It's in, in, a, in a state of preservation. But it does have patina, I will say. And that is because there was a major fire in the stable in 1970. Which, uh, which bubbled some of the paint, it cracked the windshield, but we've chosen it to leave, to leave it that way. It's part of the history of the car. We, uh, we've got it running mechanically. It didn't take much. Uh, change the tires, brake lines, battery, off we went uh, driving the car. So a really remarkable survivor. It's also the first uh, Newport history car that we acquired in the collection. So it's, it's really, um, our poster, our poster child for preservation and Newport history. And I think that this car speaks to everything that we're trying to accomplish in this exhibition, tying together these two great institutions, the Audrain Automobile Museum, the Newport Historical Society, and these objects that represent the lives of people and the life of Newport itself. So we welcome you to visit this exhibition, Women Take the Wheel, Fashion, Modernity, and the Automobile, 1900 to 1945 here at the Audrain Automobile Museum and to also visit the exhibition on the same theme at the Newport Historical Society. This exhibition will run until August 22nd and we look forward to welcoming you here at the Historical Society and having you enjoy the wonderful tour, the walking tour between both institutions to learn a little bit more about Newport and what this all means in the context of Newport history. Thank you very much.